I ask the Holy Spirit to fill me up as I preach today. May it be a good service. We are, um, as, as I mentioned at the start of the announcements, an extended time of praise and worship at the end of uh, the service today. So we just had one brief call to worship song up front, and then we'll have a longer response time where kids again will be back in the sanctuary. But I, I do want to say I'm glad you are here in the sanctuary because I know that there are a number of folks who are part of our church family. They're on spring break. They're out of state, places like Florida and such. And so if you're watching a live stream, I'm so glad you are if you are on spring break right now. But I just want to, to share in case you're on spring break and, and you don't know, when I woke up today, it was 34 degrees outside, and it's going to be a high of 47, so why would you need to go to Florida right now? I, I just don't know. I just don't know. But uh, yeah, I am wearing long sleeves. I'm very frustrated about that fact that it's April 3rd, pure Michigan. We had some snow on my car that was parked outside. But I'm not bitter. I'm not bitter. Joyful. <laughs> and so... Um, I am glad, again, whether you're here in the sanctuary or you are watching live stream, we always pray that you never don't, that we, you, you don't just go to church. You don't just check the box and say, I went to church today. But you have a genuine encounter with God that changes you, that transforms you. So that's my hope of what happens today. And so sermon today is called When God Made Me Laugh. And, and I want to begin the message today by taking you back 14 years ago to when our daughter Faith uh, was just about eight months old. For those of you who do not know, Faith is a keyboard player for the worship team. She played keys today. She'll be 15 next month. And so this is a blast from the past, back when Faith was about eight months old. Um, Kelly and I, we struggled with infertility, got married, and, and wanted to start a family, and, and were unable to for 30 months we struggled with infertility. On Kelly's birthday, she found out she was pregnant with Faith, which was just an amazing gift. And as parents of like, or new parents, right, not yet parents, especially if you're readers, like, like you read a ton of books and you're like preparing how to become parents and there's no owner's manual that comes with the child, you know, and, and all of that. And so one, one thing we learned, a fun fact we learned is that babies start to laugh around three to four months old. That's when babies start to laugh. And, and baby laughs are awesome no matter whose baby it is, really. They're awesome. There's tons of videos on the Internet of babies laughing. And, but it's especially awesome when it's your baby laughing. It, it just is. And so Faith, she loves watching our home movies that, my, that, uh, that, that we have on DVD. And so this is a clip that Faith helped me find back when she was eight months old. And as you'll see in this video, there was a particular household item that just made her laugh. So this is a blast from the past. Kelly is actually holding the Sony Handycam, so you'll hear her voice off camera. And then that is me holding Faith pre-goatee years, just in case you're wondering, pre-goatee years. So let's take a look at this Cop Family Home video. Hey, say bye, Faith. Okay, today is, <laughs> today is January 10th, and I was dusting, <laughs> and she apparently likes the feather duster. Especially at the end where she's like, ah, oh, like that. <laughs> Just love that. Come on, I can watch it all day. I ha actually had a 20-minute version of that. Thought, no, I'll show you 40 seconds. That's because it's my, it's it's our baby, not your. I I get it. But uh, see, when when God created us, He gave us the ability to laugh. So laughter is a good thing. It's a key part of what makes us human. We, we love to laugh when we go to the movies and we see a good comedy or we watch our favorite TV show with our favorite comedians or whatever. Or there's YouTube videos or TikTok videos if you're younger and hipper than I am. There are just people doing crazy, silly things that cause people to 
laugh. And actually, could, could we raise the lights up just a, a bit so I can see your hopefully smiling faces at me um, as, as I preach? So laughter, laughter's a key part, thank you. Laughter's a key part of what makes us human, and we laugh naturally at things that we find funny, like you laughed at seeing our daughter Faith laughing at a feather duster that she saw and thought was funny. That's what happens in the natural. But I want to ask the question today of, have you ever thought about what happens in the supernatural? Is laughter a part of that as well? That's what I'm preaching on today in my sermon, again, titled, When God Made Me Laugh. And I don't want you to answer out loud, but I want you to think how you'd answer this question. Have you ever been so overwhelmed by the goodness of God? Has the joy of the Lord ever filled you up so much that your mouth was filled with laughter? See, the truth is Christians ought to be the most joy-filled people on the planet. Amen? Okay, I'm going to try that again, because I don't think y'all believe that. Christians, right, if, if you're a believer and follower in Jesus today, and if you're not and you're, and you're checking things out, I'm, I'm glad you're here. But if you consider yourself a believer and follower of Jesus, you've surrendered to Jesus' death on the cross as payment for your sins. Christians ought to be the most joy-filled people on the planet. Amen? All right, come on. There's more coffee if you need it in the cafe. But right, Christians, we ought to be the most joyful people on the planet, but oftentimes we are not. There's a joke in, in church circles where they call some denominations the frozen chosen. Not going to say which denomination because there's room, in it, but it just, right? Uh, may that not be. Christians ought to be the most joy-filled people on the planet, and oftentimes we're not, and it's time to change that, and I pray that that, that, that begins as, as I preach today, that you leave more joyful and joy-filled than you were when you came, and you carry that with you as you go about your week. My sermon today is called From Brazil with Love. We, it's all about the trip I went on. This is my name badge that I wore at the church 15 hours a day when we were at the church in Brazil on the mission trip. So I've worn it in the series, week 12 of our series. And, and this, this, uh, this series has been a lot of testimonies, things I experienced as I prayed for people in Brazil and just wanting to share, hopefully fanning the flame just a more on-fire faith for all of us. Today, though, as I thought about this sermon, I felt like I needed to lay the foundation for what I saw in Brazil today. So you're not going to hear stories about Brazil, about the mission trip related to joy and laughter that people experience as I pray for them. That's going to be next week on Palm Sunday, which is actually a great Sunday to speak and preach about joy because if you think about Palm Sunday and what that meant King Jesus, right? Um, That's next Sunday. So today's really going to set the stage for those testimonies about what I saw and experienced in Brazil. But I want to take you back today, and I want to begin, this is more of a a personal journey, woven with, with Scripture, woven throughout. A foundation sermon. Going back to 2007, so going back about a year before you saw that family video, A few months before our daughter Faith was born, Kelly and I started going on Tuesday nights to Pastor Tim and Fran's healing prayer meeting just a few miles down Shelby Road and Cass Avenue there in in Utica. And through Tuesday nights, this healing prayer meeting, we were introduced to the charismatic stream of the Christian faith. There's, again, thousands of denominations and all of, like, in the core foundation, we all embrace the same core beliefs, but then certain churches, certain denominations emphasize or press into ones where other ones maybe press into, into other aspects of our faith. And again, there's all different types of churches for all different types of people, and we bless, right, God's, like God's church. We, we need to pray for the church, and we need to be more on the offensive than being on the defensive and just bring more light into the darkness of the world and, and all that. But through Tuesday nights, we were introduced to the charismatic stream of the Christian faith. And, and Pastor Tim really was a, a key influence when Kelly and I felt led. I was on staff at Kensington Church in Troy when we felt led to plant this church that we joined the Vineyard Movement 
which is a charismatic association of churches. So we are part of the vineyard, and we swim in the stream, the charismatic stream of the faith. And if I had to describe this stream of the Christian faith, it could be summed up with this thought, that we want more. We want more of the Father. We more of the Son, we want more of the Holy Spirit, because with God, there is always more. Amen, right? And, and I'm guessing the reason why you come to this church, if, if this is your church home, and, and maybe you're brand new here, and you're not sure if this, may, may this be your church home. But the reason why you come to the mission is because you're hungry. You're thirsty. You want more of God. You aren't content on your spiritual journey. You, you want more, right? You You believe that God is big, and you want God to get bigger to you. You believe God is great, but you want God to become even greater to you. You believe God is good, but you know he's even better than you think he is when you say God is good. right? You you aren't just content with believing in God. You want to experience God. You want to encounter him. And, and, And that's what we're doing. We are going after God here at the mission. And so with that being said, I want to ask you a question that every once in a while I ask. It's what do you think about when you think about God? What do you think about when you picture God? What words and phrases would you use? When when I said, we want more of God, what kind of God do you want more of? That's That's a good question. When it comes to wanting more of God, what kind of God do you want more of? Now, I know Easter is coming up, and there are some pretty good Easter specials on TV and DVD and all the streaming platforms that are out nowadays, but in my opinion, the Easter specials, they're they're good, but they pale in comparison, from my perspective, to the Christmas specials. I'm just a fan. And since it feels somewhat like December today... In the spirit of those Christmas specials that we watch on TV during that time of year, in in the spirit of those specials, when we ask the question, what do you think about when you think about God? Here's an answer that I believe to one degree or another is true for all of us. Here's the thought. We tend to think of God as a combination of Ebenezer Scrooge, the Grinch, and Burgermeister, Meister Burger. And for those of you who don't know who, Burger, who the Burgermeister is, like just saying that brings you joy, doesn't it? It should. He was the bad guy in the year without a Santa Claus who, I think that's the right one, right? He slips on a toy. Is it? I always screw that up. Okay, thank you. Santa Claus is I knew that. I felt it. He slips on a toy, and then he bans all toys because the name of the town he lives in is what? Somber town. Somber town. And I think many times, just honestly, when we think of heaven, we kind of think of somber town. It's not going to be somber town. Heaven is not going to be somber town. So when we picture what God is like, when we think about what words and phrases come to mind to one degree or another, Here's a key thought. To one degree or another, we tend to think of God as a combination of Scrooge, the Grinch, and the Burgermeister. But what if, what if God is actually the happiest being in the universe? What if? And I'm going to prove that to you today. What if God is a God of joy? What if joy is actually at the heart of God himself? Here's a scripture from the Old Testament. The people of God, they've been in Babylon, they've been in exile for 70 years, but now they're back home, they're in the Holy Land, and they're hearing the Holy Scriptures being read to them. Nehemiah chapter 8, starting in verse 9, it says this, Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest, and and also teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people, said to them all, this day is holy to the Lord your God, do not mourn or weep, for all the people had been weeping as they heard the words of the law. Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. 
And, and, and I love that scripture where it says, this day is holy to the Lord. And oftentimes, again, I was born and raised Catholic, right? This is my, my background, but oftentimes for, for, for many of us, when we think of this day is holy to the Lord, it means we ought to all look like this. Like that's a posture of holiness. And, and it is, right? But what this scripture is saying, this day is holy to the Lord, so you ought to be filled with joy. We often don't equate holy and joy together, but God does, <laughs> so we should. And I love the phrase, it does not just say, hey, joy should be your strength. It says the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord should be your strength, which tells me that in his essence, God is a God of joy. One more scripture I want to share in the Old Testament book of Psalms. Psalm 2, it says, Why do the nations conspire and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their chains and throw off their shackles. And that says, The one enthroned in heaven laughs. Right? The, that's right, Chris. The rulers of the world, they're scheming. They want to rebel against God. What does God do when he sees their plans? Is he like up in heaven, like ringing his, oh man, filled with worry and fear. No, it says, what does he do? He laughs. He laughs. When we think of God, we tend to think he is more like Scrooge or the Grinch. To one degree or another. And, and with that picture in mind, with those thoughts about God in mind, maybe that's why, maybe that's why when we think of the book that he inspired, when, when we think of the scriptures, we often tend to think this is a book of rules and a book of commands without a whole lot of joy in it. So here's something you, you may not know. The word joy actually appears in the Bible NIV translation, 247 times. And the word rejoice appears 192 times in the Bible. So like what, 450 times about? Joy and rejoice show up. So yes, there are absolutely, there are rules. God's word, there are commands that we ought to follow because Father knows best. Even if we don't understand the commands, we follow them because God knows best, right? But the thread that's woven throughout the Old and New Testaments is a thread of joy because, because the author of the Scriptures is a God of joy. So with everything that I shared so far, here's a quote I just really like. It says, Joy is at the heart of God's plan for human beings. The reason for this is worth pondering a while. He says, Joy is at the heart of God himself. We will never understand the significance of joy in human life until we understand its importance to God. He says, I suspect that most of us seriously underestimate God's capacity for joy. That's good. And so with that as the foundation, I want to dig deeper. With that, uh, with that foundation of the nature and the character of God. I want to dig deeper. As I said earlier, in 2007, when Kelly and I started going to the healing prayer meeting, Pastor Tim and Franz, just a few miles down the road, we were introduced to the charismatic stream of the Christian faith, a stream where the Holy Spirit is not the forgotten member of the Trinity. And, and since that time, Kelly and I, we've been students learning all we can about this stream of faith. And so over the past 15 years, we have learned a ton, we've experienced a ton, and we've seen things at times that stretched us at times. Now, when it comes to things of the Holy Spirit, there's a progression for me personally. love to read, and so typically the progression is it would begin with reading, and then seeing, and then oftentimes experiencing. So reading to seeing to experiencing, where I start by reading a Christian book about maybe a history of the church in revival at times. And they would talk about these various manifestations of the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit would come 
And then people, the people of God would, would do things. Sometimes they would cry or they would tremble or they would sometimes be overcome by, by the glory, the weight of God and end up on the ground. Sometimes they would laugh. And through my reading, I found out that these manifestations of the Holy Spirit are called various things. When, when people cry or sob, not just because they're sad, but because the Holy Spirit touches them, that is known as holy tears, holy tears. When the weight of the glory of God comes upon a person, so much so that they can't remain standing and they end up on the ground, sometimes that's called being slain in the Spirit, but I shared last week that I prefer the phrase being overcome by the Spirit. When people are filled with joy, not just because they saw a baby laugh, right, but because the Holy Spirit touches them, that's called holy laughter, holy laughter. And again, when it comes to things of the Holy Spirit, there's this typical progression where I begin by reading about something, then seeing it, and then finally experiencing it. So I would start again by reading, and then I would maybe go to a church or a Christian event, a conference sometimes, and then I would see people experiencing the Holy Spirit, and I'd be like, oh, that's what I read about. And sometimes that would really stretch me, if I'm honest. Again, I have an engineering background. I'm a skeptical believer by nature. So I would read, I would go to a conference sometimes, I would see people experiencing God that way. And then many times, at some point, I would go from being an observer to someone who is experiencing the Holy Spirit in that same way that I, that I had previously only read about or saw. I went from being in the stands to on the field, so to speak. So going back to what I shared as I started, God created us to laugh. Within a few months of being born, babies naturally laugh. And laughing babies are a gift to this world. They really are. And, and as we grow up, we love to laugh. We go to the movies. We see our favorite comedian. We watch YouTube videos, TikTok videos. God created us to laugh. But the question I want to ask today is, does God go further than that? At times, does God make us laugh? Now, I've been to, I think maybe 2014 was the first time I went to a Christian conference where people there laughed, holy laughter. And the first time I saw it and heard it, I thought it was weird, like a capital, capital W. And, and I judged, I judged what I saw. And so, again, we're all at a place on our spiritual journey, wherever you're at, if that's where you're at today. I ask simply that you consider what I have to say thoughtfully, test what I'm saying, test the spirit of what I'm saying as we open up God's word deeper. So again, at our church, we, we love to talk about the presence of God, and, and, and we say every Sunday, we hope you don't just come to church, but we hope that you encounter God. We hope that God goes again and again, from someone you just believe in to someone you experience. And, and sometimes maybe after church, you're in the lobby or maybe you go out to lunch and, and someone just might say, man, I could really sense the presence of God at church today. Or, or sometimes you, 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 someone might say, man, the presence of God is thick among us. That's language that you use. He's thick among us. And, and when, we, when that happens... When God shows up, so to speak, when we experience the presence of God, a question is, what emotion should we feel? What emotion should we feel? Like, for example, if it, if it happens today and you're in the lobby, would you say, wow, church was very powerful today? I really sensed the presence of the Lord. Didn't you? We wouldn't do that, right? When, when we experience the presence of God, what emotion should we feel? And, and we don't have to guess at the answer. We can open up the word of God for the answer because King David writes this in Psalm 16, speaking about God. He says, in your presence, in God's presence, is fullness of joy. 
So when we say God is present, when we feel the presence of God, joy ought to be one of the emotions we feel. And I love how David doesn't say, in God's presence is just a teeny tiny spoonful of joy. But he says, in God's presence is fullness of joy. Jumping to the New Testament, the Apostle Paul writes about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. He says, hey, the Spirit of the living God lives inside of you. At the moment you trust Christ for your salvation, he's, you basically get a new roommate, in, and now your body's a temple of the Holy Spirit. And so with the Holy Spirit inside of us, there's fruit we ought to bear. And what is that fruit? Here's what he says in Galatians chapter 5. He says, the fruit, I'm sorry, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. So number two on the list, a key aspect of the fruit of the Spirit that we ought to bear a ton in our lives, if you're a believer and follower of Jesus today, is joy. Now the Apostle Peter echoes this when he writes. He says, though you have not seen him, and the him there is Jesus, though you've not seen Jesus, you love him. And though you do not even see Jesus now, you believe and trust in him. And you greatly rejoice and delight with inexpressible and glorious joy. I love that phrase in the NLT. Inexpressible and glorious joy. And earlier I shared how the word joy appears 247 times. The word rejoice 192 times. And so I just shared three examples of like 450 examples I could have shared about joy. So because of what we believe as Christians, the fact that we are sons and daughters of our Father in heaven, the fact that if you surrender to Jesus, you're no longer a slave to sin, the fact that you are no longer slaves to things like fear, the fact that the same Holy Spirit who raised Christ from the dead lives in you, you, the fact that when you die, you will continue to live. The, the fact that one day God will make all wrong things right. The fact that one day God will bring an end to all war because he is the prince of peace. Right, Those facts ought to make Christians the most joy-filled and joyful people on the planet. Right? I mean, we should. And so with that in mind, here's a key question. If what is an outward expression of inward joy? This is not rocket science, by the way. What is an outward expression of inward joy? If we're supposed to feel joy, what is an outward expression of inward joy? Here's the answer. It's laughter. So again, going to the movies... Right? You go see a good comedy, and there's something funny on the screen. Your reaction isn't going to be, sorry, it's like this. Wow, that's hilarious. That is so funny. Isn't that funny? Like, that is, we don't do that, right? What do you do in the natural when you experience joy, when you experience, you laugh. Like Chris. There you go. Come on. I love that. Come on. It is. What is an outward expression of inward joy? If we're supposed to feel joy, we're actually commanded in Scripture to be joyful. What is an outward expression of inward joy? It's laughter. And when you read the Scriptures, when you read God's Word, that's exactly what happens again and again to the people of God. When they experience the goodness of God, and He is so good, and when people of God experience His goodness in a real tangible way, when they feel the joy of the Lord, here's what happens. Here's some examples. The first is from Isaiah chapter 35. It says, those that the Lord has rescued, will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sign will flee away. So think about, like, what would it look like for gladness and joy to overtake you? 
I submit to you the answer is actually pretty obvious. There'd be a ton of laughing going on when that happens. That's actually proven in the next passage. Like, what would happen if joy and gladness overtook someone because they experienced the goodness of God? Sarah gives birth to Isaac when she's far beyond her childbearing years. Genesis 21. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter, and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. That's actually a play on words because the name Isaac in Hebrew means he laughs. And I guarantee the day that Isaac was born, there was a ton of laughter at the goodness of God. I have another example from a book of the Bible that will probably surprise you when we talk about laughter, the book of Job. It's in there. It's in there. And if you know the book of Job, man, there's a lot of bad stuff that happens to the main character. But here is what one of Job's friends says to Job about God, what God's going to do for Job in Job chapter 8, verse 21. Speaking of God, he will yet fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouts of joy. God's going to fill your mouth with laughter. He's going to touch you, and you are going to be filled with laughter and joy. An example from the book of Proverbs, chapter 31, which is often called the wife of noble character. It's a personification of the nation of Israel, of God's people. Proverbs 31, verse 25. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. And finally, Psalms 126, which takes you full circle back to Isaiah chapter 35. It says, when the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said, among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Come on. So when the Lord makes all wrong things right, this passage says our mouths will be filled with laughter. When Christ comes again, we're not going to be saying, praise God. Praise the Lord. I'm I'm so filled with joy right now. Thank you, Jesus, for coming back. You can't imagine that, right? Christians ought to be the most joy-filled and joyful people on the planet. And if we are supposed to feel joy, what is an outward expression of inward joy? It's laughter. And I just shared a handful of examples in the Bible that show how believers in God laughed when they were overcome by the goodness of God, when they encountered the goodness of God, when they experienced the joy of the Lord. Now, Now, sometimes when we experience joy, We cry. We call them tears of joy, which sounds like an oxymoron, but it's not. I cry them all the time. I got my crying jeans from Grandma Cop. If you knew Grandma Cop, she was crying. Just tears of joy. So sometimes when we experience joy, the outward expression of that is tears. But also sometimes when we experience joy, we laugh. Now, if you were at church, if you were at a Christian conference, or an event, and someone did the former, if someone cried, you would probably be okay with them doing that. You'd probably put a hand on your shoulder, God, I bless what you're doing. More Lord, right? But if someone did the latter, if you're, at, if, if you're somewhere, if you're at church or at a conference and someone laughed, you'd probably think it's weird, right? Why, why, is, why is that? Here's the key thought. We are comfortable, as American Christians, that's the we, we are comfortable with crying but not with laughing. Why, why is that? Just think about it. And this is one of those sermons when I started working on it, I had like high hopes and expectations for how far I would get in everything that I wanted to share about it, tying it into the title of the sermon, When God Made Me Laugh. And I realized maybe a couple, three days ago, that I didn't have as much time as, as I wanted to. I really need to lay the foundation for this message, for this topic today. And so I'm not able, unless we're all here till like 1 o'clock, which don't want to be, um, that 
this sermon's going to be, be to be continued, just like last week's was. So I'm just kind of stringing you along. To be continued, you came back to To be continued next week. And then obviously on Palm Sunday, you got to come back for Good Friday and Easter. So let's just keep going. <laughs> That's the master plan. Because there's, and, and it, it's pretty cool that next Sunday, Palm Sunday, again, this is not my original plan, but God always has a better plan um, to preach on joy on Palm Sunday. It's like, come on. So for now, I want to leave you with this quote that I really hope that you think about between now and next Sunday. And by the way, this again would be a great opportunity to use the Digging Deeper questions, go through the Digging Deeper questions. These are, this is a built-in small group curriculum. You can do this by yourself. You can do this with a good friend. You can do this as a family. You can do this with other folks at the church. But to go through these questions, I'm going to read a quote that's actually question number six in your Digging Deeper questions. But again, a great opportunity to get together with others and press into what you hear. So here's the quote that I want you to ponder between now and next week. It's from Randy Clark and Bill Johnson. In their book, they co-authored The Essential Guide to Healing. Here's what they wrote. Joy is a kingdom expression. Fullness of joy exists in God's presence, according to Psalm 16, which I read earlier. And then they said, although joy has value in theory, it's often offensive in practice since joy sometimes manifests in laughter. Sometimes it does. Weeping in a service, weeping in a church service is not only acceptable to many, it's acceptable as evidence that God is working powerfully. Laughter is not seen in the same light, necessarily. Weeping is often an expression of repentance, but laughter is an expression of joy. And what weeping is to repentance, laughter is to salvation. Solomon, King Solomon, explained the body's response to joy when he states, a joyful heart is good medicine. Proverbs 17. Joy has a healing effect on the body and mind, and as a kingdom manifestation, it is priceless. That's good. That's good. And so as you live your lives this week, as, as we approach Palm Sunday, may we live out a key aspect of our identity in Christ, and a key aspect of your identity is joy. It ought to be joy. Christians ought to be the most joy-filled people on the planet. Joy is at the very heart of God. Joy, joy is part of God's will, and it's part of God's plan for human beings because joy is at the heart of God himself. And we will never understand the significance of joy in our lives until we understand how important joy is to God. Most of us, I included, seriously underestimate God's capacity for joy. God is a God of joy. And so as sons and daughters, may we be a people of joy. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, so now we're going to respond.